Okay. Hello, like. Paula Corrales, and thanks for accepting my invitation for this interview for the Reproducible Research Scout YouTube channel. Please introduce yourself. Hi, Ronieri. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm Paula Corrales. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, I am a PhD student in freak sciences here, uh, and I've been working for almost four years uh, trying to improve a severe weather forecast uh, for this region. But I also uh, spend a lot of time thinking about education and also uh, developing and teaching courses related to R, to some other tools, and always with uh, an eye on reproducibility. Thank you. It's very nice to speak with someone that works on uh, weather forecasts. It's a uh, very uh, computer heavy area, <laughs> and I imagine that yeah. you use a lot of high performance computing. How do you define reproducible research and why it, it is important for you? So, the main idea when I think about reproducibility is uh, in the technical sense. And with this, I mean that if you have the data and the code that someone uses for uh, some research, some results, you should be able to uh, get the same thing uh, as the, the original author. But that doesn't mean that the, this uh, result is good. It only means that you can uh, have the same thing. So it's sometimes not enough to say, well, this is perfect. But for me, it's really important to, uh, to do things in a reproducible way because we are always uh, using our own results, other people's results to build upon tho those. And if we cannot trust or is uh, those results were produced in a very obscure way, we cannot say or use it in a in a good way to to build and to continue the the, the investigations uh, over those things. That's good. Very nice. Thank you for the good explanation. Uh, I was looking at your, some of your previous recent academic publications, and I saw some really nice figures and. I want to ask you, how much reproducible are some of the figures? Do you want to tell us a little bit more of how you have been working? So I think the figure you mentioned uh, is part of a paper that was uh, written uh, between many, many people. And that was very challenged <laughs> uh, because some of them uses Python, I use R, and it was a challenge to try to uh, work right. with all the tools and and at the same time have a, a good uh, process in in the way so um i i try all the time to uh, save the code and and have a repository for everything i do so i can come back to that or other people can come back to that uh, but I've been uh, working with more complex tools to have a, a whole uh, um, working flow that allows me to reproduce what I do in terms of uh, R packages, uh, its versions, <laughs> the version of R, and all the things that usually are uh, under the table when you run code, uh, but you need those to to reproduce what you are doing. So I've been uh, I, I I can say now that uh, my next paper will be completely reproduced <laughs> yeah. before, if uh, I uh, find a way to share also the data. Uh, I have I use. Uh, big, big amount of data, and those are difficult to share, but I, I'm on the process to do that. When, you, when do you talk about big? Is on the gigabyte scale or is the exa scale? Uh, 
it's in the terabytes okay. uh, world. Yeah. Cool. Because um, you have the the original observations, uh, and those are usually public in the atmospheric science world. Uh, we are uh, very good at sharing data uh, between countries and everything because it's, it's like completely necessary to do research and also to like do a forecast for tomorrow. But I also do simulations to uh, I do I, I simulate the atmosphere and those uh, those results are usually very very heavy <laughs> so yeah there is any way to have like a close to the end data output that makes re reproducible a little bit more easy for the end uh, user or uh, that's that a, a good question you will always uh, so to reproduce my work, you could uh, start from the very, very beginning with the observations and run this uh, numerical model that represents the atmosphere, try to reproduce everything from that. But you could start from uh, the results of that numerical model uh, and try to, to build up on that. But what you are saying is it's an interesting idea is to uh, post-process or try to, to reduce that big amount of data to only what you need for the for the this research. And that probably will be a, a little less uh, data, maybe one terabyte or less, and that okay. will be more so manageable. Still, so it's still a lot of data. So we are talking, like I guess we, I started talking about code uh, uh, in terms of reproducibility. The data side is also challenging. Okay. So you mentioned that you are a PhD student, almost getting your PhD. Yay! will be Dr. Paul soon. And yeah. Can you share yeah. with us what has changed since you start your PhD, like almost four years ago? in terms of the developer environment that you have been using and other people have been using, how much easier or harder has been make your re research reproducible compared with the past? Uh, so if I try to run again the R markdown file that, in, uh, that I wrote for, for my degree, uh, like five or five, six years ago, I won't be able to do, to run it correctly. It will arise like millions of errors because uh, our package versions, a uh, broken path to the data and things like that. Uh, from that, I now uh, know more, but also there are more development in this area. Uh, tools that allow you to control the environment you're working on, uh, the R packages, the R version, uh, and sometimes also in, in my uh, field study, the uh, system libraries you need <laughs> for like some uh, specific uh, tools. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the main uh, improvements from from those years. Uh, I can control more uh, what I use and how I use it. Uh, and I, I also able to put that in, in some kind of package that I can share with others so they can uh, run uh, what, I, what I'm doing uh, mostly uh, OK. That sounds very nice. Uh... You mentioned that you have been working with other research that use Python, although you mostly code on R. I heard there is a R package to bring the gap or do the bridge. Have you been using? Yeah, I have some experience using uh, Reticulate is the name of the package. Um, because sometimes I, uh, there, there are very good tools in the Python world that 
I can use and, and it will be great to use uh, in my research. I, it's, uh, and I, I have some experience using it. Sometimes it's uh, hard, but mainly because I don't have a clue on how Python works. <laughs> Yeah, but I know that people use it like all day, every day, uh, without any problem, and I think it's great. And we shouldn't yeah. keep only one language if we can use the best of both or all worlds. Cool, sounds very cool. Uh, what is the big, biggest advice that you have for someone that's starting to use R in their research to make their research reproducible? today uh i i will say that the my main step was to start using a uh, literate programming uh, mean, uh, and with uh, this i mean using for example our markdown files to have my ideas, thoughts, or the analysis of the results that I'm producing with the code that is on the same file. So everything is all together and you don't have uh, things uh, disconnected and with the possibility of mixing things up. And I, I'm talking from the R point of view, but you have other tools in, for example, Python for yeah, these. I have the Jupyter yeah. notebooks, yes. Exactly. So that was my, my first step. And I think it's, it's, not, uh, it's not difficult to translate something you have in an R script to R Markdown. So it's, it's, it's a good way to start. And I heard that now there is something called Quarto. I do. Heard. Yeah, I heard about that. I haven't tried it, but uh, I want to try it. Okay. Uh, I I also heard that it's really uh, it's similar to our markdowns in the way that you can use your old files and translate it to Quarto without much pain. Uh, and the good thing is that you don't you can use other languages with it. So if you don't want to use R, you don't need an R installation. You can use Python, for example. But I haven't tried it. I, okay. I probably will keep using our markdown for, <laughs> okay. for a few years, at least in my research. I may try to, to learn uh, how to use it for, for teaching. Yeah. Some, some, something for our next future speaker to, to be talking about. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to, to switch to something else when you are working Work with. Yeah, you need to have yeah. your production tools. So we almost running out of time. Any project that you want to share with our audience? Um, so if the audience wants to learn uh, more about reproducibility, I just taught a, a workshop about reproducibility and the, all the materials are open, uh, CCPI licensed. So uh, you can... Uh, We'll you can find it in, in yeah uh, in my web page or Twitter or wherever, and if it they find it useful, please let me know. And if they find errors, please also let me know. Cool. <laughs> it's a nice. it's a work in progress. Uh, while I try to use the tools myself every day. Cool. Let's collaborate to make better materials. So I want to thank you, Paul, for your time and this joyful conversation. Uh, enjoy your day and big success on your Viva soon, Dr. Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>